It's a big, tough, heavily built shipboard fighter, pulling 2,000 horsepower on the takeoff. Greater power and higher wing loading means she'll land faster and stall quicker than the older, slower types of fighters. Normally, the ground crew will start the engine, but every pilot should be familiar with the starting routine. With ignition off, the prop is pulled through three or four times to clear the cylinders. A cartridge is placed in the breech of the starter, which is reached through a door in the accessory compartment. Cowl flaps, open. Alternate air control, in. Prop control in low pitch, high RPM. Blower in neutral. Mixture control in idle cutoff. With fuel selector on reserve, the booster pump is used to raise fuel pressure to about 17 pounds. The engine is primed for four to seven seconds depending on whether it is warm or cold. Moving the mixture control forward and back aids in priming the induction system. And the cartridge starter, energized by means of a switch on the distribution panel, must be held on until the engine runs smoothly, as it also controls the ignition booster. As soon as the engine starts, the mixture control is moved to automatic ridge. Do this slowly to avoid flooding the engine and adjust the throttle to give not more than 750 RPM. The wings are spread by moving the hydraulic control lever to the spread position. are fully extended, the small doors at the wing joints close, indicating that the hinge pins are in position. Then these hinge pins are locked by pulling up on the D handle and turning it clockwise. This will silence the warning horn, which blows throughout the last seven degrees of the wing spreading operation. As you go up in horsepower and performance, it becomes more and more important that you take nothing for granted. You must know all about the controls, operating mechanisms, and power plants. There are more than the usual number of hydraulic devices, and you need to be familiar with their functions. The cowl flaps have no indicator, but you can see their position from your seat. The intercooler flap position can be seen on the indicator, because the position is impossible to see from the cockpit. The same is true of the oil cooler flap. The three-point attitude of the airplane on the deck will vary depending on whether the tail wheel has a pneumatic tire or one of solid rubber. The latter brings the tail somewhat closer to the deck, but with the pneumatic tail wheel, the airplane rests at approximately the stalling angle of attack. Shocks are removed. Brakes release. And you're ready to taxi away from the line. You'll probably have a tendency to use too much throttle. The brakes are very effective, but don't attempt a long taxi requiring a lot of braking. You can't get rid of the heat. And as you can see, Taxiing is necessarily slow because of the necessity of S-turning to get better forward vision. Early models of the F4U are equipped with a check-off list switch instrument. When this switch is turned to takeoff position, the warning horn for the landing gear will not blow. Later models, however, do not have a check-off switch instrument. The check-off list for taking off and for landing are placed on separate plates mounted on the instrument panel. Prior to takeoff, you check the following. Wings and lock. Arresting hook control, up. Otherwise, you will be unable to retract the wheels after takeoff. 
fuel tank selector on reserve, a 50-gallon standpipe in the main tank. The main tank is pressurized and self-sealing. It has a total capacity of 230 gallons and is the only tank to have a quantity gauge. You have a 57-gallon tank in each of the outer wing panels for use in cruising. They're equipped with a CO2 vapor dilution system, but are not pressurized. Mixture control is automatic rich and blower in neutral. Propeller control down for maximum RPM on the takeoff. Cowl flaps two-thirds open. Intercooler closed. Oil cooler open as required. Set the rudder tab six degrees right. Aileron, six degrees right wing down. Elevator tab, one degree nose up. These settings compensate for left wing heaviness due to engine torque. Alternate air control, in. Here's the flap control. But well, we have a good runway at this field, and this first takeoff will be with flaps up. When the oil temperature is above 40 degrees, and cylinder head temperatures are above 120 degrees, Open up to about 30 inches in full low pitch. Check your mags fairly quickly. The drop shouldn't exceed 100 RPM. It is usually between 50 and 75. Freedom from vibration is a good indication that the big engine is functioning properly. When you've gone through the checkoff list and you're all set, lock the tail wheel and take off into the wind. Ease the throttle forward and approach full power in step. Notice that the pilot did not pull the airplane off. He avoided a stall position by flying off the field. She'll take off very nicely with 45 inches and 2,700 RPM, but you can pull up to 53 and one half inches if you need it. Don't take off until you have enough speed. If you do, you'll have some deficiency of aileron control and left wing heaviness. After reducing throttle and RPM to the desired setting, pick up the wheel. Let's go back and make a takeoff with the flaps down. For a carrier takeoff, you'll use about half flap, 20 to 30 degrees, with full power, while holding the plane with the brakes. Extreme caution must be observed to hold the tail down with the stick to prevent nosing over and digging the prop into the deck. With your flaps down, tab settings are even more important to reduce the force needed to maintain your run and takeoff path. Six degrees nose right, six degrees right wing down, and about a degree nose up. After you have retracted the landing gear, when you have 110 to 120 knots, bring the flaps up in easy stage, about 10 degrees at a time. This way you can control a flap failure and you won't lose altitude. You can maintain your altitude and climb. You can use your full takeoff power for a military climb of about 3,000 feet per minute. But after five minutes, you must throttle back to normal rated power for continuous operation. 43.5 inches at 2,550 RPM in neutral blower. With this power setting, your rate of climb will be about 2,000 feet per minute at a best climbing speed of 125 knots. At about 8,000 feet, you will have lost about three inches of manifold pressure. If you want to continue the same rate of climb, you must throttle back three to four inches of mercury, open the intercooler flap, and shift to low blower. Increase your manifold pressure to 47 and a half inches, and keep climbing. You can carry this power up to 13,500 feet where again, you will note a loss of about three inches of mercury. If you want more altitude, throttle back to lose an additional three or four inches and shift to high blower, followed by 48 inches of manifold pressure. 
Always keep your intercooler flaps about one half open when using low or high blower to maintain intake mixture temperatures within safe limits. A red warning light will indicate excessive temperatures and warn you to reduce power. Open the intercooler flaps wide and, if necessary, shift to a lower blower. Use automatic bridge for all your climbing and maneuvering. You're using a lot of power, and if your mixture is not rich enough, there's danger of burning up the engine. Use a partial power climb if the tactical situation permits. Around 135 knots is about the best indicated speed. The cylinder heads have a rather high limitation, 260 degrees, and this should be used with caution. Oil temperature shouldn't exceed 95 degrees. Let's level off for cruising. In the combat overload condition, you can carry 344 gallons inside and 160 in the droppable belly tank, a total of 504 gallons. Refer to your pilot's handbook frequently for data on fuel consumption. If you use military power, you'll burn 275 gallons an hour. Rated power, over 200. Maximum cruising condition will be in automatic lean, 2330 RPM, 32 inches in neutral blower below 14,500 feet. This condition will burn about 100 gallons an hour. Recommended cruise is automatic lean, 2150 RPM, 29 inches in any blower, using about 80 gallons per hour. You can cut your RPM down to 1,350 at 29 inches and reduce the gas consumption to about 45 gallons an hour. With this low power, your two to one reduction gear will be turning the prop at 675 RPM and the Corsair will hum along like an oversized sewing machine. Burn up your wing tanks first. They have no gauges, remember. And begin with the left one. That's the wing which stalls first due to the torque reaction of the engine. Now that we've attained a safe altitude, let's explore the stall characteristics of this airplane. We're going to stall with power off in the landing condition. With the flaps at 30 degrees, she'll go at around 77 knots and go quickly. Regain control as quickly as possible and you'll run no chance of trouble. preceded by very little warning in the nature of buffeting. Stick pressures are heavy, but with experience, you'll become familiar with the F4U's stall characteristics. In approaching a power stall in the clean condition, the control movements will be very small, and there is only a quick warning. At about 85 knots, there she goes, off on the left wing. Stick pressures are heavy. You can help them with your tan. Prompt, positive action results in a normal recovery. All right, let's put the wheels down and lower the flaps about 30 degrees. You'll want to familiarize yourself with her feel and behavior in this condition before you try any carrier landing. stalls a few knots slower with an incipient spin to the left. Again, prompt action and normal technique bring about normal recovery. Now let's see how she behaves in a dive. The open cabin is not designed for speeds above 300 knots, so be sure it's closed before diving the airplane. Go through your checkoff list. To extend the landing gear for diving, don't use your landing gear control or you lower your tail wheel, which won't stand up to high speed. Lower the wheels with the dive brake control. This will leave the tail wheel retracted. Throttle slightly open. Mix in automatic bridge. 
Fuel tank on reserve. All flaps closed. And you're ready to push over. Make your corrections early in the dive and don't let the engine rev at 3,060 for more than 30 seconds. Don't exceed the speed and acceleration restrictions placed on this airplane by current technical orders. And don't exceed 7 Gs in any loading condition. At speeds below 175 knots, you can shorten the radius of a turn by lowering your flaps to not over 25 degrees. They're not to be used in diving or in pullouts, but were designed for possible use in increasing maneuverability at slow speed and to assist in taking off and landing. However, it would be poor tactics to try to dogfight with any airplane with superior maneuverability. Use that reserve power and get out of there. The Corsair is not restricted as to acrobatic maneuvers, such as the loop, which may be entered at a speed of about 210 knots, the Immelman, also executed at about 210 knots. And the slow roll, which may be performed at a speed of approximately 180 knots. As you come in to make a landing, always go methodically through your checkoff list. Keep in mind that the airplane in the three-point position on the ground is approximately in the stalling angle of attack. If you pull the tail down beyond this, the airplane will stall drop the left wing and make a rough landing. Flaps will normally be down about 30 degrees. Come in with power and make your first landing slightly tail high. You may notice the left wing getting a bit heavy, but you can set her down on two points and use the rudder to maintain your direction. If the tail is forced down at high speeds, a pronounced buffeting effect will develop and the plane will swerve. However, when the tail is held up by forward pressure on the stick, the buffeting effect will be slight and swerving will be minimized. Notice that the airplane should be down on all three points before the brakes are touched. You can't see directly ahead, and therefore you must be doubly alert to maintain your path. Normal technique with the brakes will maintain your direction, and experience will bring competence in any flap setting. Now let's watch the F4U come in for a field carrier landing. The normal landing checkoff list is used. But for this type of landing, flaps are fully extended. As you approach the mat, keep your eyes on the signal officer. Slightly fast, he wigwags. Now, a little low. When he gives you the cut, close the throttle, break your glide, and set her down. Get to know the installation, controls, and engine operation of the F4U. Familiarize yourself with her takeoff and landing habits and rather abrupt stalling characteristics. There's nothing about the Corsair that good pilot technique can't handle. There's 
plenty of guts in her engine and plenty of sting in her gun. Use her power and speed for your own advantage and put bombs and bullets where they will be most effective.